everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining uh, me for the webinar, Estate Planning for uh, Busy Parents. So uh, for uh, the next hour, um, I want to share with you all some of the secrets of estate planning that you might not know. There's a lot of misconceptions out there and my goal with this webinar is to leave you with a better understanding of what can go wrong with or without estate planning and what documents you need and how to get them in place so that you can make educated and informed decisions on what's best for you and your family. And so uh, the best way for you to get the most out of this time is to turn your phone off, uh, close your uh, door, and uh, and you're going to, uh, now that I got my screen sharing going, you should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation. Um, as we go through things, you're gonna need your whole brain to understand this. So um, I would put the phone down for a little while if you wanna get the most out of this. Uh, so next. And then um, at the end, I'll let you know about a, a bonus for sticking around for the end. Uh, spoiler alert, it saves you money. Uh, okay, uh, there's a webinar workbook that is in the uh, dialog box for the GoTo webinar that um, you can print out the workbook if, if you like, or you can just uh, refer to it throughout the webinar to stay engaged and make sure you get the most out of this. Um, if you want to think about some questions, uh, write them down. Um, you can post questions uh, live in, uh, in the dialog box here. And I've got my uh, crack paralegal Tiffany here manning the questions. So um, if I can't answer it real time, she'll be uh, answering stuff she knows about uh, while we're in the middle of this. So feel free to post questions as we go. All right, and uh, how many of you saw the poll in the webinar box? It, it looks like uh, from the poll, I'm seeing that 100% of you have said that you do have a will. Um, and uh, regarding having a will in any kind of estate planning, it's not some that it's fun to talk about. And about 70% of Americans don't have any kind of estate planning at all. And um, you'll see in a few minutes how that can uh, be extremely costly and uh, outright uh, create uh, unleash hell in a family. So. Uh, the three biggest doubts about estate planning, um, you can look at uh, number one on your workbook. Uh, people think that somehow planning for the death will somehow hasten its occurrence. Uh, they think estate planning is gonna take too long or that it's gonna take a lot of time or uh, you know, I, what I hear people tell me all the time in probate when I'm talking about transferring somebody's uh, estate who died without a will is, the person who died that didn't have a will just told everybody, oh, my wife gets everything, or oh, the kids get everything. Well, uh, that may be true, but the, the probate process that you have to do to get there is costs a lot more money, and if anybody disagrees about who should be in charge or anything, which is really common, uh, then nothing happens and everything becomes extremely expensive, and then lawsuits start flying. Um, so it's the, the most important thing you can do with estate planning is just putting somebody in charge of property, uh, period. And uh, figuring out who it goes to is, is another thing uh, in and of itself, but having somebody with the authority to act is really, really important after that. And so uh, the uh, good news is, is I've never had somebody pass away immediately after it. Uh, and you do owe it to your loved ones to make sure they're protected and the benefits of estate planning aren't tied to the, your age, wealth, parent, uh, or marital status. Um, and like we just talked about in the, in the previous slide, you, know, you don't make all of these documents for yourself. You make estate planning documents for the people that have to clean up after you're gone to where it makes their life easier to care for you and your, and your assets after you're gone and before you're gone. Um, so what you're going to learn today is uh, how to name guardians for your minor children, how you can avoid probate court entirely, um, what main estate planning options you have, uh, the difference between a will and a trust, and also we'll talk about how to protect your children's inheritance. Um, getting your own affairs in order uh, just begins with starting your own estate plan and uh, what's involved. 
And by the end of the webinar, you're going to have all the information you need to make your decision on your own estate plan and what you want to do. And uh, more importantly, um, you'll know the cost of it and how to move forward with my firm in case you uh, decide to do so. And uh, we will uh, have a bonus at the end. So uh, this is me. I uh, went out on my own in 2008 after I left the firm that I was at for six years. I've been licensed since uh, for 21 years now. And uh, I've been doing probate and estate planning ever since I went out on my own. So uh, feel free to check me out online. I've got a lot of Google reviews. I'm five-star rating. Um, I will uh, give you the same level of service. So, um, you know, uh, you uh, for those of you that have an estate plan, uh, and for those of you that don't have an estate plan, you might think that you don't, but you actually do. Uh, it sounds like everybody here has a will, but for people that don't have a will, uh, Texas has already written your estate planning package for you. And so um, if you uh, want to opt out of Texas's estate planning package, then you do some form of estate planning, like making a will or some of the other options that, uh, that we'll talk about today. This pie chart right here is a graphical representation of the uh, laws of Texas descent and distribution, which is the legal effect of not having a will. There are some more pages uh, regarding uh, other scenarios, but this is the main option that comes up with married people and, uh, and married people with children. Uh, what happens in Texas with intestacy is if uh, there is a second spouse and there's children from outside of that marriage, the second spouse is in for a rude awakening when their, uh, their husband or wife dies because then they find out that the house that they owned with their spouse, uh, that the spouses share, is now owned by their stepchildren uh, and perhaps some of their children, uh, which is a, a shock to many people after they bought the house together. Uh, so uh, the goals of your estate planning is to figure out, uh, to give what you have to whom you want and the way you want, when you want. You want to avoid probate court, uh, uh, you want to maximize your assets distributed to your loved ones, and you do that by decreasing the cost of the asset transfer. Uh, you want to care for yourself during your lifetime from incapacity to your health and financial. Uh, we do that with the powers of attorney and the directives to physicians. Uh, you may want to fulfill some charitable intentions. We include that in your uh, will or your trust. And if you want to minimize taxes due at your death, um, that doesn't come up with a lot of people because in Texas we don't have an estate tax uh, and married couples can transfer almost $26 million at this point without any death tax. Uh, but the current legislature is looking at making a change to the estate tax, so uh, that's something to pay attention to. Um, uh, another goal of your estate planning is you want to care for and protect your others, such as your surviving spouse and your children at death. And you want to also pass on some of the values and ideals on how you would like your children raised, uh, particularly with your guardian of the minor children and whoever you designate as the trustee who would manage your child's assets uh, throughout their younger life. And then also um, well, another goal of estate planning is to, to the extent possible to protect the assets from creditors, divorce, and bankruptcy uh, for not just your generation, but for uh, generations to come. And so uh, the downsides to dying intestate is that uh, assets get distributed according to state law. Um, and dying intestate just means dying without a will. Um, and uh, if, uh, the, if you do die without a will, the inheritance that is had, the kids would get whatever money there is outright at 18. Um, a spouse could remarry after your death, leaving whatever money they inherited from you to a new spouse and their kids. Uh, a judge will decide who raises your children if there is a dispute about it. Uh, a judge will decide who is in control of your children's money um, if there's any kind of dispute about it. And uh, probate court is absolutely guaranteed uh, in most instances when dying and testing. Um, so what would happen to your children if something happened to you? Um, if uh, you have anybody that's under the age of 18, one of your top priorities is getting in writing who you want raising your children should, should something happen to you or your spouse. Um, most parents of minor children need that kind of planning more than anyone. 
it is the hardest decision that all my clients have to make. It's pretty easy to pick who you want to get your money, but uh, who's going to raise your kids is a different story uh, because they have such an impact on their life and their personality. Um, so um, if you don't have a plan, there's a default plan and you probably won't like it. Uh, a judge gets to ultimately make decisions if there's a dispute about anything. There could be a fight over who is the guardianship over your kids. Um, if the two different families of the children both think that they are uh, the better suited family for your minor child, then there could be a showdown in uh, probate court over who gets possession of, uh, of the child. So um, uh, often in-laws can end up battling for custody. Uh, it's uh, not good and uh, the solution for it is we just nominate guardians within your will. If it's a couple, we both uh, say what happens if they divorce. And when it's a couple, we both make we make sure that both people are designating the, the same folks to where we don't have conflicting designations. Okay, and then, uh, but what about the money? So, and what is uh, an estate generally? You hear people talk about it a lot, but it's essentially just a bank accounts, checking accounts, savings accounts, assets, uh, which are cars, boats, motorcycles. Uh, any accounts held in a financial institution, such as brokerage accounts, stocks, bonds, uh, life insurance proceeds, uh, houses, and any other real estate, any kind of mineral interests, uh, retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, any type of personal property like coin collections, jewelry, or artwork. If there's any kind of intellectual property, such as trademarks or patents, um, all of these things are uh, things that, that you own and any business interests as well, uh, whatever membership interest in uh, LLC or stock that you own uh, in a uh, closely held business, all of that is uh, part of your estate. So your estate is just comprised of all of your stuff uh, from whatever source. And uh, the, the biggest issue that we come up with and why we have to have probate court is uh, because of title. And so probate is required for titled assets. And uh, what probate does is it allows us to transfer titled assets of a dead person who can't transfer the assets anymore because they're already gone. Um, but it provides for uh, a mechanism as far as who can do it and also who gets it. Um, there are three ways that you can own property at, at death. And you can, if you just uh, have it in your own name, it's just held individually. So that an example of that would be if you had a bank account that was just in your own name alone, even though you're married, you can have a joint bank account. And that's a, a, a joint bank account. A lot of times a husband and wife will start it together. A mother and daughter might start it together. Those accounts by default at banks always have a right of survivorship. So those automatically pass to whoever is the last man standing. Uh, it, you can also uh, the title can be held for certain assets, uh, money or real estate uh, can be done by contract. And there can be a written set of agreements that exist uh, uh, by contract that automatically kick in once somebody dies. Uh, the common example of that is a life insurance policy where you have a contract with the life insurance company to pay your designated beneficiary a certain sum of money after you pay premiums during your lifetime. Uh, and then other examples of by contract are uh, bank accounts that are payable on debt. And as we'll see here in a few minutes, uh, real estate can also pass by contract with the insurance on debt fee. Um, the, uh, there is some risk with jointly owned assets, uh, such as with a joint owned bank account. Um, it does avoid probate when the first owner dies, but you would still have to go through probate when the second owner dies, um, or if you die at the same time. The, the best answer for that is to designate somebody as payable on death um, as your beneficiary designation. Um, but uh, a lot of people go and put their minor child's name as a beneficiary designation. It's a terrible idea and it creates an incredibly bad legal issue for the minor child. So um, you want to generally have your spouse as your primary beneficiary that's designated, but you never want to have your children especially if they're under 18 designated as the backup because you're forcing uh, the child into a guardianship if they're under 18 uh, in order for them to receive the money down the road. Um, so uh, what are uh, different options that are available? 
Uh, and uh, this, uh, I, I see a lot of homemade wills come in here for me to probate. And uh, the, I see a lot of things why wills show up that don't work, um, estate plans that just outright fail. Um, why most estate plans fail is poorly drafted documents. Usually it's a homemade will that um, somebody made from some form online and they list off all of these specific items of personal property that they want to distribute, but they never say where everything else goes. And it's almost worse than not having a will because then we have to probate the will and then we also have to probate the estate for the person as if they didn't have a will so that we can figure out who gets everything else that wasn't mentioned in the will. Uh, poorly drafted documents can uh, create a, a big headache after death uh, and they won't provide for any kind of probate avoidance. You'll end up in probate court anyway. Um, and uh, uh, those documents won't be timely updated. And most times under those uh, homemade documents, the children will be getting their inheritance at 18, won't have any check valves on the money, and it won't be protected from ex-spouses in divorce, bankruptcy, or, or other lawsuits as well. Um, so uh, starting off with good documents is uh, is the most important thing because you can't fix these things after somebody becomes incapacitated or after they're dead. Uh, so uh, your uh, options are, uh, three different main options are uh, suitable for most people. The first option is doing a uh, last will and testament. Um, the second option is doing a probate avoidance package. And then the third option would be doing uh, using a revocable living trust which is a trust that we make during your lifetime. If you're a married couple, the husband and wife make it together. And then we use the trust to own assets. And we use that uh, as, a, as a vehicle to own assets. And we use that to avoid probate because the trust owns the property, not the individuals. And going back to the title rule that we talked about, um, if the trust owns the property, we avoid probate because there is no change in ownership. The trust still owns the property. We just have a new backup trustee come in after somebody dies that is in charge of the trust. Um, these three options uh, are, are suitable for uh, different folks depending on your, uh, your situation. Um, a last will and testament is, is way better than nothing. Uh, like we talked about a few minutes ago, dying in test date and all of the things that can happen. Um, having a will is, is way better than nothing, and it's a, a fantastic start uh, because it designates who's in charge of your property, and it also designates who gets your property. Uh, and it will, uh, if it's done properly, it will nominate a guardian for your children and also name beneficiaries for your assets. So you get to name an executor to wrap up your affairs. You get to name your beneficiaries. The only problem with doing a will is that a will is just a written set of instructions that have yet to be carried out. You still have to probate a will in probate court to make it happen. Uh, the reason for probate court is to make sure that the actual will that's being brought to probate court is the actual last will and testament that this person made before they died. And so the probate process is a, uh, is a lawsuit in open court where the will gets aired out and everybody gets an opportunity to come and attack the will if they want to or to make a claim against the estate. Uh, and then once the probate court admits the will, um, then uh, everybody has to rely on it. That includes insurance companies, title companies, and everybody else. Uh, but where a will fails, like we talked about, we still have to go through probate court. Um, they don't provide for what happens if you become incapacitated. Uh, sometimes they can become problematic across state lines. Uh, if, if it's a homemade will, the kids will probably get the money at, eight, at age 18, um, and it may, not, uh, it may not address all of your property, and um, it won't provide for anything as far as preparing for what happens should you become incapacitated during your life or for during the lives of the, your surviving spouse and children. So uh, where there's a will, there's a probate, and so other options, uh, and another reason why you just don't want to end up in probate court is it's just it's an open lawsuit downtown for if anybody wants to start trouble, they have a pre-made place that they can go file a lawsuit into. 
Um, if a predator wants to make a claim against you, it's a real easy place to go make a claim because there's already an existing lawsuit. If we set up things to where they transfer outside of probate court, all of these things happen behind the scenes and outside of uh, the public knowledge. And so if a predator wants to start something or if a family member wants to start something, they have to hire their own attorney, hire, uh, file their own lawsuit and figure out where to file it. Um, it's a it's a very different world um, uh, if uh, you're running into people that are trying to give you trouble uh, versus the assets transferring through probate court versus outside of probate court. Uh, but in probate court, if we're probate in will, the court will appoint an executor over the will. The executor's job is uh, to carry out the terms of the will. The executor may be a beneficiary. They uh, are not always the beneficiary. It could be the brother of the dead guy who's distributing the money to the uh, dead guy's minor children. Um, in probate court, there will be a published, uh, there'll be a publication to of a notice to creditors that gives them a chance to come and make a claim against the estate. We have to file an inventory uh, as to what assets were in the estate. That becomes a public record that anybody can view. Um, it provides for the power for the executor to distribute assets. Everything is reported back to the judge. And in certain situations, if there's a dispute, we, you know, it will need court permission uh, to do any type of distributions. And uh, you almost certainly have to hire a lawyer to get a probate uh, case done. Even probate, uh, even attorneys that don't do probate uh, generally don't know what they're doing in probate court. And uh, uh, it, it's just a foreign world with uh, foreign words, e even amongst lawyers. So the downsides of probate court is it costs money, it takes time and it's done in public. Uh, so all three of those things are uh, potentially downsides. Um, the cost of it is 5,000 per person uh, and it keeps going up every year. Uh, it's one filing fee they go up on every year uh, and uh, because I think most people don't find out about it until after they're dead. So for a married couple, you can count on at least $10,000 of your money being spent on lawyer fees and court costs, even if you have a will, because you're going to have to get a lawyer to uh, do probate court. And right now, my flat fee for doing a probate for uh, a self-proven will made by a lawyer is $4,450 in Harris County. And so um, that'll be going up to 5,000 uh, January 1 next year. So um, we can uh, eliminate that. And um, this is just an example of a family estate. We've got a, a house that's worth 400,000, a rental property that's worth 100,000, some stocks and bonds that are worth 250,000, 1 million of life insurance that's payable to a minor, which is not good. Uh, 401k payable to a minor, that's a bad setup. And um, if, if somebody didn't have a will um, and then they pass away down the line um, and, and, it, and say it's a married couple, they have a minor child, then the two families are fighting over who's going to be in charge of the children, um, who's going to be in charge of the probate assets. Uh, and it, it, you could easily spend $40,000 uh, uh, in probate fees on guardianship litigation, probate litigation, um, and it could go well beyond that if the fight goes on. Um, and uh, one thing to figure out for yourself is what is your COD number? Uh, the COD is just short for your costs of death. And so if you look at the three columns here, we look at, we evaluate it from if you die in test state versus if you die in test state, and that's if you do the silver estate planning package that I have. And then the next column for is you, you do the probate avoidance package, which is the gold package. And then the last one is the revocable trust package. So, and then you'll see on the left, there is the, uh, the cost versus control versus the time. And so you see under an intestate probate, it's uh, even if everybody agrees on who's gonna be the administrator and everybody agrees on who's gonna get what and how it's gonna be distributed, it'll still cost 15,000 to do probate between hiring the probate attorney and then the court costs for the court appointed attorney from the probate court. Um, the, with an intestate probate, the control, uh, you get to decide now, but um, it, everybody has to voluntarily do it. Uh, probate can be indefinite if you die without a will and there's a fight over things. Uh, 
if you go to the next column and look at the uh, testate probate, um, right now that would be about nine thousand uh, dollars in probate costs after uh, husband and wife passed away. Um, and so if you go one step up to doing a probate avoidance package where we use transfer on death deeds to uh, transfer the property, uh, which I'll explain more in a minute, uh, your probate uh, cost goes down to zero. And then with the revocable living trust package, you also see that the probate cost there also goes down to zero. So um, with, with that in mind, um, just the probate uh, cost is just uh, tossing money away and um, there's benefits to avoiding it. So um, we talked about this. And so you might wonder when, why would I just do a will? Well, some people, uh, it's if you just want to get an estate plan put in place and you want to name guardians and you don't care about how much probate court costs and they can pay for it after uh, you've passed away, then um, that is uh, the perfect plan for you. Um, you know, in the event you're leaving everything to a charity or something, you may want them to pay for probate and, or to pay for the probate instead of paying for advanced estate planning. Um, but in, in this case, uh, probate avoidance is the goal. So a will is usually not sufficient for uh, for most people as far as what they would like to happen. Um, so then if a uh, will's not the answer, uh, there's a better option. It's uh, something that I have created up here. I just call it a probate avoidance package. And it's essentially just a collection of documents that allow you to avoid probate and they are uniquely tailored to the individual client's assets. And so uh, we avoid probate uh, with a combination of transfer on death deeds for your real property You'll hear me talk about those as an acronym, just as TOD deeds, uh, T-O-D-D, short for transfer on death deeds. Um, the uh, transferring it with a transfer on death deed avoids the complexity of a will or a trust administration. Um, with a transfer on death deed, after somebody dies, the uh, all you have to do is post a memorandum of death in the real property records for Harris County and then that automatically uh, transfers the real property into the next person's name. Uh, that is, that's nice because no additional deed has to be made. Nobody has to read a trust and tell somebody what it means. It, it's an automatic thing. Uh, the nice part about doing a Todd uh, deed is you can revoke it. Uh, even though you make it and file it during your lifetime, if whoever you gave it to subsequently uh, uh, you want to change things down the road because relationships change, you can change it or amend it. Um, this also in, uh, includes doing powers of attorney, just like the regular will package. Um, and those take care of all of the incapacity issues that uh, can come up and create issues with medical or money prior to when somebody passes away. Uh, think about if somebody has dementia or Alzheimer's and they're still alive. Um, so, with the probate avoidance package, we still do everything to take care of everything prior to death. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, uh, for most of you, probably most everything you own now is a probate assets. Uh, what the probate avoidance package does is we'll position your assets like your real and your personal property to where they pass directly to your children. Uh, we'll be doing that with the transfer on death deed, uh, instructing you on how to set up your bank accounts with uh, joint tenancy that has right of survivorship, uh, uh, transfer on death designations, payable on death designations, and, uh, and setting up your beneficiary designations in such a way that you utilize your trust and your trustees to uh, direct the money to your beneficiaries. Um, you still maintain control over all the assets and uh, everything you own bypasses probate when you pass away. Uh, so that's uh, usually new information for people. Uh, a lot of people think that you have to uh, probate uh, court, go to probate court, but you don't. And one of the best ways you can avoid it is one of uh, with one of the transfer on death deeds uh, that we do in a probate avoidance package. So, common example of where a Todd uh, works well is, uh, for instance, uh, Bob has a $500,000 house and he wants to leave it to his son Fred when he dies. Um, uh, it works for Bob because his kids are grown and he wants simplicity. And uh, 
Uh, so therefore, BOP needs a probate avoidance package. Um, the uh, three methods on avoiding probate, so the, with real property, we use either uh, uh, transfer on death fees or we use revocable living trust, which will be the next option we talk about uh, next. Uh, and financial, you set up all of your bank accounts to where there are pre-existing agreements where all of those accounts go after you pass. And for vehicles uh, in the probate avoidance package, uh, most people don't know that you can actually designate beneficiaries for your vehicles with the state of Texas now too. And for married couples on the probate avoidance package, we uh, designate uh, two, uh, up to two vehicles and retitle them uh, to where they have beneficiary designations. That way there's uh, nothing required for probate to transfer title on the vehicle. Um, okay, yeah, and then uh, you all have total control and everything is automatic. Uh, now, if uh, there is a, an even more advanced option, uh, which is utilizing the revocable living trust, uh, these have been used for decades to avoid probate, and a trust is just a uh, written document uh, that has a, a, a list of instructions on, uh, on how property is to be managed that is put into it. Um, you can think of it as a will on steroids, but it, it's not a will, it's something totally different. It uh, names your beneficiaries within the trust. It is revocable, uh, just like if you had made a will. Uh, we, we change trusts all the time. You can amend it, you can revoke it. Um, and you're also the trustee during your life. Um, and if it's a married couple, you're both trustees together and you have total control. Uh, the trust does, uh, for a married couple, the trust is not uh, changeable after one spouse passes away. Uh, most married couples like to know that uh, because it gives them some comfort that the surviving spouse isn't gonna marry somebody much younger and redirect all the assets to somebody else other than the kids. Um, so uh, probably everything you have now is outside of, of a trust, yeah, certainly because you don't have one. So we would uh, help you uh, position yourself to move your assets into your trust by retitling them into your trust or set up things to where they automatically transfer to your trust after death. Um, you, still maintain, you still maintain total control over your assets in the trust. Um, and the biggest benefit is everything that you put in there by, bypasses probate when you pass away. Um, and you might be thinking, aren't trusts only for rich people? And uh, that's not true. Uh, uh, trust is just a written agreement that spells out how you want uh, the rules to be set up for property that gets run through it. Um, uh, here's an example of where a trust package works best for, uh, for Bob. So uh, Bob has, uh, say, 100000 in a bank account. Uh, and he wants to leave it to his son, Fred, when he dies, but he wants to make sure that Fred's at least 25 and that he's graduated college. Uh, well, in that instance, Bob would want to have a trust because we're going to want to put in some conditions. So um, where uh, the, the biggest difference between uh, the decision between a probate avoidance package versus a revocable living trust package mostly comes down to whether or not you have, have younger children um, if you need to designate guardians and you need to set up trust for children that need to be managed until they uh, get older, uh, a revocable living trust is the best way to go because if we do a probate avoidance package, it's just an automatic title transfer um, with, no, with no check valve built in for controlling assets uh, that go to anybody that's, that's younger. And particularly if somebody's 18 or even under 25, you don't want them having that kind of money free and clear. Uh, to make bad luck decisions. Um, so within, within every trust, there are three different hats or roles that uh, you can have. So the, the first one is the grantor, also known as the settlor. This is the person that's uh, putting their own assets into the trust. Uh, the grantor settlor person has the authority to designate the trustee. The trustee is the boss of the trust, and that's the person who has the authority to distribute assets. The beneficiary is the person who is supposed to get the assets from the trust. They all can be the same person, and a lot of times they are in the beginning. Um, and so, uh, say uh, Harry and Wendy, they both make the trust together, they both are the beneficiaries together, and they both are the trustees together during their lifetime. 
and they said uh, we set up all the property to go in here with total control and then it still avoids probate. Um, and again, the magic is how you hold title to your assets and getting title set up right uh, to where um, it's not held individually after you're gone. So uh, just to help you conceptualize this, a revocable living trust is similar to uh, like a backpack, if you will. Um, it avoids probate only for the things that you put inside the backpack. So looking on the screen here, it, there, uh, there was a Dr. Pepper sitting next to this backpack with a little girl on the hill. Um, you are not going to avoid probate with that. That's going to be her uh, drink sitting beside her that's her in, owned individually. Um, so it's uh, not good to make your trust and then not put any assets into it. You will end up in probate court. And... Uh, that is one of the main concerns when you make a trust. It's good to have your assets into it and you need to make sure that as time goes on that you uh, maintain your assets in the backpack uh, so that you continue uh, to be set up to avoid probate. Um, so uh, the, it solves all the problem, problems that come with the will. Um, you uh, won't lose a good chunk of your estate in probate for the assets go to your family in uh, in weeks and not potentially years. And it's totally private uh, during life and at death, uh, which is really nice. Um, trusts are easily changeable. They're valid in every state. Uh, they're difficult to attack. Um, it's not a separate tax identity from you. You can open up bank accounts in your trust under your own social security number. They are not difficult to create and maintain. Uh, my office can help you maintain it as well with our client care program. Um, and it uh, creates one backpack for all of your property. Um, and then you might be wondering, but what about guardians uh, in the instance where you have a revocable trust? Well, in, uh, in, in that instance, we, even though you have a revocable trust, we still do a will uh, for you. Uh, we do a specialized will called a pour-over will. And that will just says that if I forgot to leave anything to my trust, I leave everything to my trust. So it just pours everything over into your trust. In that pour over will, we will uh, nominate the guardians for your minor children, just like if we were doing a regular estate planning package uh, with no trust and just wills. Um, things that all parents worry about after, after we're gone, uh, what if your kids get divorced? What if your family assets go to strangers? Nobody wants that. What if your kids lose their inheritance to creditors or lawsuits? Uh, that doesn't sound good to anybody, I'm sure. Um, so here's an example of Harry and Wendy that have uh, two kids, Denise and Sam, um, and they take, uh, Harry and Wendy haven't taken any steps to make sure their wealth is not wasted once they're gone. Um, Harry and Wendy just have simple wills and which dump everything uh, to Denise and Sam. And so uh, they end up uh, leaving behind a, a sizable estate and then, uh, then you know, Somebody can have a, a poor spouse, and then there ends up a divorce. There's a lot of money just in the bank in somebody's name, and it got run into a community account. Once assets have been commingled, it's hard to characterize them as separate property anymore, even if it's been inherited, and there goes half. Um, or another example is like a, a, you know, a liability from uh, a litigation. So Sam accidentally leaves the water running in the bathtub, goes out for the night, downstairs neighbor sues, and then uh, has a, a nasty lawsuit about it and ends up with a big legal bill from the judgment. Uh, so the Children's Trust uh, is like a tube of toothpaste. So it's uh, totally protected uh, to the extent it's in the tube. Uh, but uh, once the money comes out of the toothpaste, it, it's uh, uh, no holds barred on it. Um, you know, their creditors can get it, lawsuits can get it, divorce can get it, uh, but to the extent it stays in the trust, it's protected from all of that. And you get to pick the trustee over that trust, that way you can make sure that uh, the ex-spouse or anybody else uh, isn't going to be in control of the money that's going to your kid. Um, the money to the extent it's still in the tube of toothpaste in your trust, it protects Denise and Sam's inheritance while still giving them access to it. Um, and so, yeah, you just squeeze, uh, uh, you want to squeeze out just a little bit of the toothpaste at a time and leave as much in the trust as possible. 
because it's protected policy. And so uh, we talked about earlier about uh, estate taxes. There's only, uh, Texas doesn't have one. There's a federal estate tax, but it's right at like 25.8 million right now. So um, if you're interested in taking the next steps on uh, getting uh, some estate planning work done at my office, uh, uh, we can answer what you need to do, how to make it happen, and you should get started. Um, so for, uh, you might be wondering, can I just make these, uh, documents myself and pull these forms uh, from online. Uh, do it yourself is great for crafts, but I wouldn't recommend uh, this for wills. Uh, much like you can operate on yourself, it's probably better to get a doctor to do it. Um, and uh, really the same goes for estate money. So um, I would be aware of any uh, do it yourself or bare bones trusts out there that may not comply with state law and they won't provide you any type of personalized planning like you would get uh, with attorney representation. It'll be a cookie cutter design that's implemented nationwide uh, and it's often uh, not properly funded or improperly funded uh, by the words on the document itself or by the actions you take. Um, when you work with an attorney, you're paying for the guidance and counseling about how the documents should be drafted, not just the documents themselves. Uh, which uh, makes an important uh, point as far as where the direction the assets are headed. Uh, the traditional experience would be hourly billing for things like this, which is just reactive and transaction-based. Um, I do everything on a flat fee basis up here, um, so we stay proactive and uh, we're more relationship-based. And um, because you know, we uh, for the estate planning process, uh, we generally do these uh, these webinars, and then the next step would be for you to come in for a face-to-face -face design meeting uh, with me, where we'll sit down and go through all of uh, your questionnaire that you'll fill out. Um, I have a family profile that is the next thing we'll send you. It's where you'll give me your family structure, list all your assets. And then uh, the next step will be a design meeting with me where you come in and we will pick which package you wanna do, whether it's the silver, gold, or the platinum, and uh, assign who's going to serve as the different roles under uh, your estate planning. And then after that meeting, I will go away and prepare all of your documents and then uh, prepare uh, an email to you with a document review video where we'll send out drafts for you to review and then we get you to come back in for uh, a signing meeting uh, that you come in for face-to-face -face and, um, and then you'll leave with your originals after that signing meeting. And then we send you scanned copies of all of your originals and then we keep a backup copy up here forever. And uh, you get a nice uh, estate planning binder uh, that goes with all your documents so you can keep everything in, uh, in one place. So uh, you get what you pay for when, uh, when you work with an attorney for estate planning. Um, and there's certain things you want to avoid bargains on, like parachutes, scuba equipment, and brain surgery, and uh, estate planning is right up there up with that. Um, the silver package is where we would just be doing a will for you. Um, all of these are gonna have powers of attorney and all of the other documents that address issues that happened prior to death. Uh, but the silver package is where we'll just be doing a, a will uh, and the powers of attorney. It'll have a contingent trust for children in there, but with the silver package, uh, the, the probate will be required. It will not avoid probate. Uh, the gold package is the probate avoidance package, and that's the one where we use transfer on death deeds. Uh, we still have a will that we do for it. It's just a super basic one-page will that just, uh, uh, is a just-in-case type will. Um, and that's $3,000, and uh, it uses transfer on death deeds to transfer the real estate, and uh, it'll have powers of attorney for uh, medical and financial decisions for anything that happens during your life or if you become incapacitated. Uh, the platinum estate planning package is the revocable living trust package. Um, it sets up children's trust that can last for their lifetime or a staged distribution. It still has all of the powers of attorney that all the other packages have. Um, additionally, we do an assignment of personal property and uh, it contains a certificate of trust and um, uh, like all of these, all of these have the uh, estate planning binder that comes with it, uh, signing meeting with me, and um, the, uh, in addition, the probate avoidance package also has a 30 minute, uh, 30 minutes that I spend with you on 
how to set up your bank accounts to where uh, they effectively avoid probate after you have passed away. Um, so those are the three packages uh, that I'll offer. The Platinum Plan, uh, this is the list of all the documents that are included in it. It has the revocable lending trust, a pour over will, the children's trust, a certificate of trust, uh, power of attorney, uh, healthcare proxy, uh, HIPAA waivers, living will, which is also known as a directive to physicians. It'll nominate guardians. Uh, it comes with an explanation of documents. Title transfer instructions, a certified copy of the trust. Uh, we also do an assignment of personal property, which can help with assets that weren't transferred during life. Uh, we will include final disposition instructions for you and a binder, and also send you electronic copies of all of the documents. So uh, the next step would be to uh, book a design meeting uh, with me. And um, if you want to, just uh, touch base with Tiffany and we will send you an appointment link. Uh, uh, where you can pick an available date on my calendar. So for the design meeting, both spouses need to attend. You'll need to fill out the family profile uh, before we meet. Uh, I will answer all your questions and discuss your goals at that uh, meeting. You will uh, select the estate planning package that works for you, and then I'll prepare an engagement letter, uh, which is just what you sign with an attorney when you hire them. Um, I'll collect the fee in full, and then we will go and design your estate plan and get you back to sign it. Um, thank you all very much for attending my webinar today. Uh, so for all of y'all that attended, um, $250 off for whatever estate planning uh, package you, uh, you pick if you schedule your design meeting uh, here in the next 96 hours. So, uh, and that's just scheduling it, not actually doing it. So um, we would have it take place in the next two weeks. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, please post them up here in the poll or in the question section. And I don't see any questions just yet. So um, OK, so uh, who, uh, who we work with um, are people who have taken the time to watch this webinar so that they can make informed, educated decisions. Um, we like to work with people who don't have an estate plan or who want to update their current estate plan. And uh, we work with people who are ready to get started with the process. Um, please don't request a meeting if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you're just looking uh, for ideas to sit down with an attorney. Um, also, don't request a design meeting if you already have documents in place and you're just looking for a second opinion. Um, and also don't if you have questions about your specific situation but you're not ready yet to move forward. Um, and again, please uh, check me out online. I've got uh, a really good reputation and a lot of happy clients that uh, come back for their updates. And I would like to add you uh, to my list of clients and make you a former client as well. So uh, thank you all very much. Is there a question? Can you talk about irrevocable trust? Can you talk about irrevocable trust? Wow, this is a good question. This is a real hot topic nowadays. I get asked probably once every two weeks uh, to create an irrevocable trust. Um, I don't know what articles are out there that make people think that these are a good idea. Irrevocable trusts are bad. I will not make them for people. I won't take money to make them for people. Uh, the problem with irrevocable trusts is that uh, inevitably, the person that makes it down the line is going to want to get at those assets for themselves and they're not going to be able to and they're going to be upset and they're going to be upset at the person that made the irrevocable trust and so then they're going to come back to the lawyer and say why can't i get to my money uh they are just there's no real good purpose for them um there's uh, there's way better uh methods of asset protection than creating something that provides a roadblock between you and your own money. Um, the only time an irrevocable trust should be used is if you have an estate that's worth more than $26 million and you're utilizing it to get life insurance money out of your gross estate. That's the only time I would recommend using an irrevocable trust because otherwise they just create problems down the road. I hope that answers your question. I'll give it a couple other seconds and see if anybody else has any other questions. But 
other than that, thank you all very much for attending today, and um, I look forward to speaking with you soon at a design meeting.